A very good evening aspirants. I welcome you all to the Hindu daily news analysis brought to you by Shankar IS Academy. Now before getting into discussion, I have two important announcements to make. The first announcement is regarding prelims test series. Shankar IS Academy is going to start pre-storming batch 1 for UPSC prelims 2024. The orientation for the first test will be conducted on 11th September 2023 and the first test will be on 18th September. A total of 48 tests including CSAT and mock tests will be provided in the test series. The fee details of the test are displayed here. Kindly register to the test series immediately and boost to your prelim score. Now coming to second announcement. The second announcement is regarding all India open mock tests for mains 2023. The test starts on 1st September 2023. Use this wise chance and boost to your main score. To know about detailed information of the test, click the link provided at the top of description column. With this exciting announcement, let us get into the news analysis. Today I am going to cover important news articles from the Hindu newspaper dated 29th of August 2023. Displayed here is a list of news articles that we will be discussing today. You can go through it. At the end of the video, we will also have prelims practice question discussions. So try to watch the entire video. And a kind request to you all, those who haven't yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel, do subscribe and hit the bell icon button so that you will get regular notifications about our current affairs videos. Now let us get into our first news article discussion. Take a look at this news article. This news article talks about the increasing peafowl population in the country in general and Kerala in particular. Since 2000, Kerala has witnessed a 150% jump in the peafowl numbers. Now, what is the reason for this sudden increase in population of peafowls? Here, the article provides some reasons for the increase in population. The first reason is that as the peafowl is more assimilated to the arid region, the overall drying of the weather in India has aided its population growth. The next reason for increase in population is that the peafowl was given legal protection under the Wildlife Protection Act. So, the effective implementation of the Wildlife Protection Act has reduced poaching of peafowls across the country. So, these are the two main reasons for increase in peafowl population. This is all about the news article. Now, in this context, in our discussion today, we will see some important points about peafowls from Purlum's perspective. Now, first, let us look at the distribution and habitat of peafowls. The Indian peafowl is native to the Indian subcontinent and neighboring regions. Its distribution spans across India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal and Sri Lanka. The peafowls prefer a range of habitats including forests, grasslands, scrublands and cultivated areas. It mainly prefers dry climatic conditions. One thing unique about the bird is that it is often found near human settlements. This phenomenon is due to its adaptability to survive in various environments. Okay. This is all about the distribution and habitat of Indian peafowls. Now let us look at the unique characteristics of the peafowl. Firstly, the peafowl has a distinctive plumage. Here plumage is nothing but the feathers of peafowl. The male Indian peafowl which is called a peacock has elongated feathers with striking colors like deep blue and emerald green. Then in the case of females which is called peahens, they have less extravagant plumage. The plumage appears with a mixture of colors like dull brown, green and grey. These colors provide effective camouflage to the peahens during nesting. Now coming to the diet of peafowls, see the peafowls are omnivorous. They feed on a varied diet including grains, fruits, insects, small vertebrates and plant materials. Okay, this is all about the characteristics of peafowl. Now let us see the conservation status of peafowl. The Indian peafowl is listed as least concern in the IUCN red list of threatened species. This status indicates that the species is not currently facing imminent threats of extinction. But the Indian government has placed it in Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. This is to provide maximum protection to the peafowl as it faces certain threats in India. Okay, This is all about the conservation status. Now coming to the threats to Indian peafowls. The first and foremost threat is habitat loss. 
this is due to rapid urbanization agricultural expansion and deforestation see the habitat loss has resulted in fragmentation of their natural habitats the next threat is hunting despite legal protection hunting and poaching for their feathers meat and body parts continue to pose a threat to indian peoples then the last major threat is predation the eggs and chicks of the indian peofol are susceptible to predation by various animals this further impact the population of indian peofols okay these are some of the threats faced by indian peofol and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the habitat and distribution of indian peofols then about the unique characteristics of indian peofols and finally we saw some points about the threats and conservation status of indian peofol see this topic is very much important for your prelims exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this editorial article here this article highlights the historic achievement of indian athlete neeraj chopra at world athletics championships 2023 recently the 2023 world athletics championships was held in budapest hungary in that event neeraj chopra won a gold medal in javelin throw he became the first indian to win gold medal in javelin throw at world athletics championships this is india's third medal at the world athletics championships the first medal was won by anju bobi george in 2003 and the second medal was won by neeraj chopra last year last year neeraj chopra won a silver medal in javelin throw and this year he came at the first place and he won a gold medal this year the second place was secured by pakistani athlete arshad nadim he won silver medal which is pakistan's first ever medal at world athletics championship this is all about the event here the author of the editorial was worried over the poor performance of some indian athletes so the author suggests a review of training by athletics federation of india and sports ministry this is all about this editorial now let us see some basic information about world athletics championships the world athletics championships is an international track and field event it is one of the most prestigious competitions in athletics it provides an additional opportunity to athletes to compete on the world stage outside of the olympics see the world athletics championships covers a wide range of track field and combined events like running walking jumping and throwing know that the first world athletics championships was took place in helsinki finland in 1983 until 1991 the event was held once every 4 years then from 1991 the event is being held every 2 years that is the world athletics championships is a biennial event okay now talking about the events under world athletics championships see the championships has a variety of events including sprints middle distance and long distance races hurdles relays high jump long jump triple jump short put discus throw javelin throw and cross country races okay now who organizes the world athletics championships see the world athletics championships is being organized by the world athletics it is an international sports body that governs the sports of athletics it was formed as International Amateur Athletic Federation in 18 July 1912 at Stockholm, Sweden. In 2001, International Amateur Athletic Federation was renamed into International Association of Athletic Federations. Then in 2019, International Association of Athletic Federations was finally renamed into World Athletics. Okay. Despite the organization was formed in Sweden, it is now headquartered in Monaco, which is a European country. Okay currently the world athletics has 214 member federations i know that india is also a member to the organization see in addition to world athletics championships the world athletics also organizes world under 20 championships and world under 18 championships to promote youth participation in athletics okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the recently held world athletics championships 2023 then we saw some basic information about world athletics championships and an organization named world athletics now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this news article from the opinion page 
this article talks about the need of comprehensive sexuality education in india as you all know sexuality is an integral part of human life but how many are educated about sexuality and how many are aware about sexuality this is the question here according to unesco's global education monitoring report only 20 percentage of countries have laws and 39 percentage of countries have a national policy that specifically addresses sexuality education see india is one among the countries which neither have a law nor have a national policy regarding sexual education now with this background in this discussion let us see what is comprehensive sexuality education then why india needs it then what are all the challenges associated with imparting sexual education in india and how the problems can be solved okay this is what the plan now before getting into discussion the syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here you can go through it now let us begin with what is comprehensive sexuality education see basically sexuality refers to sexual feelings thoughts attractions and behaviors of one person towards other person now coming to comprehensive sexuality education see comprehensive sexuality education which is in short called as CSE is a program where young people are educated about their sexuality by providing accurate and age appropriate information here the term comprehensive means that the program covers a range of topics on sexuality and sexual and reproductive health throughout childhood and adolescence see according to un global guidance comprehensive sexuality education should start from the age of 5 along with formal education through an established curriculum and as i already said the information provided should be scientifically accurate and it should be tailored for different ages this means that young children will be taught about their bodies emotions the basic principles of consent and how to deal with violence bullying or abuse okay so in simple words comprehensive sexuality education is typically introduced at an age appropriate level and gradually build upon throughout a person's education until adolescence okay this is all about the basics of comprehensive sexuality education see the comprehensive sexuality education program has various impacts see the impacts and the need for such a program are the same now we'll see them one by one firstly providing accurate information on sexuality helps the individuals to make informed decisions about their sexual health and well-being secondly learning about sexuality aspects helps the individuals to develop the skills that are required to establish and maintain respectful and consensual relationships thirdly access to information about contraception and safe sex practices can help to reduce the number of unintended pregnancies fourthly the sexuality education helps individuals to understand how sexually transmitted diseases and sexually transmitted infections are transmitted and how they can be prevented and treated this will contribute to the reduction of transmission rates especially among the younger population fifthly and most importantly sexual education can foster respect for diverse sexual orientations gender identities and cultural backgrounds so sexual education promotes inclusivity and reduces discrimination and stigma related to sexuality apart from this the sexual education counteracts myths and misinformation about sexual health and it empowers individuals to set boundaries and to recognize potentially harmful situations thereby it helps in recognizing and preventing sexual abuse harassment and exploitation okay this is all about the need and impact of comprehensive sexuality education now coming to india see india lacks such a proactive comprehensive sexuality education program and it neither has law nor has a national policy with respect to sexuality education according to the national crime records bureau 51863 cases were reported under the protection of child from sexual offences act that is pokso act in 2021 of the 51863 cases 33348 are 64 percentage were of sexual assault cases even if several state governments formulate policies they were not socially accepted while some says that the program sexualizes children and other says that the program violates indian values see our traditional values are often shaped by patriarchal and hierarchical social structures 
so there is a hesitation in the society to adopt to modern programs so this is the first major challenge for india to impart comprehensive sexuality education in formal education secondly in the context of pokso cases consensual adolescent relationships are frequently criminalized in india so the high court of madras delhi and meghalaya have asked the government to reducing the age of consent which is 18 years see actually this happens due to lack of awareness about sexual consent among adolescents when adolescents are educated about sexual consent they themselves can identify where they are exploited and abused this in turn will reduce the criminalization of consensual adolescent relationships here reducing age of consent is not at all required since even judiciary lacks this understanding the push to comprehensive sexuality education remains a challenge in india thirdly teachers actually lack the knowledge to talk about diverse topics included in the comprehensive sexuality programs see capacity building of teachers is very important to impart sexuality education in india but educating the teachers in the first place remains a challenge in india so this is another challenge and finally the author concludes by saying that the responsibility of sexuality education is vested with the state governments in india so the states have the freedom to develop their own creative curriculums the curriculum can be developed within the framework suggested by united nations population fund additionally the judiciary can persuade the government to formulate a national policy which can act as a guidance to state governments in imparting sexuality education and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about what is comprehensive sexuality education then about the need for comprehensive sexuality education then we saw about the challenges in imparting sexuality education in india and finally we saw some way forward to impart sexuality education in india so you can use these points while writing your main sentences now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article here yesterday the prime minister virtually addressed the rosgar mela held in 45 locations across the country in that address he stressed the importance of yoga to the newly inducted officials of central armed police forces this is all about the news article now in this context let us learn some points about rosgar mela and its significance in reducing unemployment in india now let us start with the objectives of rosgar mela scheme see the main objective of rosgar mela is to provide employment opportunities to the youth all over the country basically rosgar mela is a recruitment drive to hire 10 lakh personnel for 38 government ministries and departments now we shall see what are the posts covered under rosgar mela see the selected candidates under rosgar mela will be appointed across various levels like group a and group b gazetted posts group b and group c non gazetted posts the posts covered under rosgar mela include sub inspectors constables lower division clerks stenos income tax inspectors and so on under the rosgar mela the union home ministry also fill a significant number of posts in various central armed police forces okay now moving on to say about the training procedure under rosgar mela see the newly selected candidates under rosgar mela will be trained under karma yogi prararam it is an online orientation course for all new appointees in various government departments the course will teach them code of conduct guidelines on workplace ethics and integrity human resource policies etc okay now we shall see the significance of rosgar mela initiative as we all know india is aiming to become the world's third largest economic power but rise in unemployment rate pose a huge threat to this goal as it leads to wastage of human resources for example one percentage increase in unemployment rate reduces the gdp by 2 percentage apart from this as per the nsso periodic labor force survey india's labor force participation rate for the age group 15 to 59 is only around 53 percentage this means that nearly half of the working age population is jobless so this much of unemployment rate potentially reduces the gdp now in this scenario rosgar mela helps the job seekers to learn about job openings and it also helps to apply for jobs on the other hand the rosgar mela also helps employers to find qualified candidates by this way rosgar mela can help to reduce unemployment and it promotes economic growth 
see the newly appointed officers under Rosgar Mela will also help the government in implementing the government initiatives and schemes. So the government can better serve the underserved persons and it also try to increase its GDP growth. So ultimately the Rosgar Mela is a step towards the fulfillment of Prime Minister's commitment to employment generation. The Rosgar Mela will act as a catalyst in employment generation and it will also provide opportunities to youth to participate in national development. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about various aspects of Rosgar Mela and finally we saw about the significance of Rosgar Mela in reducing unemployment in India. Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this editorial article. As we all know the G20 summit in Delhi is about to commence next month that is September 19. So the editorial here is written in this context only. The editorial highlights a few steps that can be taken at the G20 summit to tackle climate change. This is about this editorial. So in our discussion today we will look at the share of G20 countries in global carbon emission then the steps taken by the G20 countries to tackle climate change and finally the steps that can be taken by the G20 countries to effectively address climate change. Okay, this is the plan. Now before getting into discussion, I have highlighted the syllabus regarding this discussion. You can go through it. Now let us start our discussion by looking at the share of G20 countries in global carbon emission. See the G20 countries includes most of the developed countries and the developing countries of the world. The G20 members represent around 85% of global GDP, over 75% of global trade and about two-thirds of world population. As we all know, economy for most of the human history was fueled by fossil fuels. So the G20 countries being economic powerhouse have significantly contributed to global carbon emissions and climate change. Look at this image here. This image highlights world's top 10 greenhouse gas emitters. In this, the top three emitters that is China, the US and India contribute 42.6% of total emissions while the bottom 100 countries only account for 2.9% of global greenhouse gas emissions. See the top 10 countries alone contribute to 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Of these 10 countries except Iran, the rest of the countries are part of G20. When we take all of the G20 nations, their contribution to greenhouse gas emissions is more than 80%. What can we conclude from this data? We can conclude that for a significant reduction in global greenhouse gas emissions, the commitment of G20 nations is an utmost necessity as they are major contributors. So recognizing this, the G20 countries for their part have taken some steps to combat climate change. Now we look at the steps taken by G20 countries. The first major step is 2015 Paris Climate Agreement. See all the G20 countries are part of Paris Agreement. As part of this agreement, the G20 nations have pledged to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels with an additional effort to limit it to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Then many G20 nations have set emission targets to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. For example, the European Union has set a target of reducing its emissions by 55% by 2030. Then in the case of China, the world's largest emitter, it has pledged to peak its carbon emissions before 2030 and it aims to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. Okay, This is the second major step. Then to reduce emissions, almost all the G20 nations have invested heavily in renewable energy sources such as solar and wind power. This has increased the efficiency of renewable energy sources and reduced the cost of assessing renewable energy sources. For example, Germany aims to produce 65% of electricity from renewables by 2030. So the investment on renewable energy sources is also seen as a step to combat climate change. Fourthly, to ensure access to finance to adapt green technologies, the world nations have set up the Green Climate Fund. This international fund supports climate projects in developing countries and it has received contributions from various countries including developed nations like Germany and the United Kingdom. 
so we can say that the g20 member countries are supporting other nations to adopt green technologies fifthly to ensure collaborative efforts between nations the g20 nations are part of united nations framework convention on climate change and they attend the conference of party summits to tackle climate change in future and finally to prevent the use of fossil fuels many g20 countries have adopted carbon pricing for example canada implemented a nationwide carbon pricing system which includes both carbon taxes and cap and trade programs at the provincial level this will deincentivize the use of fossil fuels okay these are some of the steps taken by g20 countries to combat climate change now coming to india specific information see india for its part has also taken various steps to combat climate change for example in the cop 26 which is held in glasgow india announced its climate action plan which is often referred to as panjamrit or five fold strategy the panjamrit outlines a set of goals aimed at addressing the challenge of climate change as part of the panjamrit india aims to achieve five goals the first goal is to reach india's non fossil fuel energy capacity to 500 gigawatt by 2030 The second goal is to meet 50% of India's energy requirements from renewable energy by 2030. Then the third goal aims to reduce the total projected carbon emissions by 1 billion tons from now onwards till 2030. And the fourth goal is that it aims to reduce the carbon intensity of Indian economy by less than 45% by 2030. And most importantly, the fifth goal aims to reach target of net zero by the year 2070 okay so through panjamrit initiative india outlines a set of goals to address climate change apart from this in cop 27 india put forth its lt leds that is long term low emission development strategy see this is a road map to achieve net zero emissions by 2030 other than this india has taken other steps to combat climate change For example, India set up International Solar Alliance along with France at COP27 in Paris to promote solar energy. Apart from this, India has also announced its intended nationally determined contribution. Okay, these are the measures taken by India at the international level. Now, coming to domestic measures, India has announced various schemes like National Solar Mission, then Fame India, Pradhan Mantri Ujjwala Yojana, National Biofuel Policy. the national mission for enhanced energy efficiency and so on see these schemes aims to reduce greenhouse gas emission and aims to combat climate change okay these are some of the steps taken by india to combat climate change due to these efforts india is the best performer among the g20 nations for example among the g20 countries india is the only one in the top 10 of the climate change performance index 2023 okay See while India and the other G20 countries are working hard to fight climate change they need to do more to achieve the goals of Paris climate conference so the editorial suggests some three steps that can be adopted by the G20 nations to fight climate change the first step is that the G20 nations must create a clear governance framework see the G20 countries should work together instead of separately so that the benefits are shared equally to work together the g20 must create a plan with clear cut responsibilities individually the nations can create interministerial councils to ensure synergy while implementing just energy transition here just energy transition is the process of shifting from fossil fuels to renewable energy while giving necessary attention to social justice inclusion and equity here the g20 nations can look at south africa model See South Africa has established the Presidential Climate Commission to implement just energy transition. And finally to measure progress the countries should not look at traditional indicators like job created and economic growth but also look at the type of jobs then who got the jobs and how communities have become stronger and with time. So the G20 nations should take all this into consideration while establishing a global governance framework. Secondly the G20 nations must give due attention to sustainable economic transition. The sustainable economic transition will help ensure long term economic stability, protecting livelihoods and securing public revenue streams. But for this to happen 
the financial institutions must play a supporting role. The financial institutions must provide support for energy efficient technologies and low carbon industrial process. In this aspect, the editorial highlights the example of green steel. The G20 countries represent a significant portion of global steel production and consumption. So they can play a significant role in the adoption of green steel. Here green steel is the steel produced using low carbon emission technology. See production of green steel is capital intensive. So the financial institutions can provide a targeted credit to aid the production of green steel. In addition to this, the G20 countries must make a collective commitment to procure green steel. This will ultimately decarbonize the steel sector across the globe. Like this, the G20 nations can set forth the sustainable economic transition. And the final step is, the G20 nations must ensure transparency. See, improved transparency and accountability are essential components of successful energy transitions. So the G20 can play a part by establishing mechanisms that disclose relevant data related to energy transitions. In addition to this, the G20 can encourage countries to disclose information about their energy transition plans, projects and strategies. This is particularly important for fossil fuel producing nations. This information will help in assessing the overall progress towards global climate goals. Okay, so these are the steps that can be taken to prevent climate change. Since India is hosting this year's G20 summit, it has an opportunity to talk to the other G20 countries about these ideas. If they agree, it could help find a good solution for climate change that lasts for a long time. Okay, and that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the share of G20 countries in global carbon emission, and the steps taken by G20 countries to tackle climate change, and finally the steps that can be taken to address climate change in future. Now with these points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now take a look at this front page article. This article focuses on the observations made by Chief Justice of India regarding the impact of Article 35A. The Chief Justice remarked that Article 35A of Indian Constitution gave special privileges to permanent residents of Jammu and Kashmir and at the same time it denied fundamental rights to other residents of Jammu and Kashmir. The Chief Justice said that Article 35A violated three fundamental rights of Indian citizens. Okay, this is the crux of the news article. Now in this context, let us first see about Article 35A in general and then the fundamental rights that are violated by Article 35A. Now let us start with Article 35A. Article 35A was added to the Indian Constitution by a presidential order in 1954. This order was issued under Article 370 of the Indian Constitution. See, Article 370 of the Indian Constitution grants special status to Jammu and Kashmir. Okay. Now, coming to Article 35A, Article 35A provides special rights and privileges to the permanent residents of Jammu and Kashmir. As we all know, these special rights that were granted to Jammu and Kashmir was revoked by Government of India in 2019. So, some people have filed several petitions in Supreme Court challenging the removal of special status that were provided to Jammu and Kashmir under Article 370. And the Supreme Court is now hearing the case and it recently observed that Article 35A which was issued under Article 370 violates several fundamental rights of Indian citizens. Okay. Now, what exactly does the Article 35A says? The Article 35A says that people from outside Jammu and Kashmir cannot buy or own any immovable property in Jammu and Kashmir or they cannot settle permanently in the Jammu and Kashmir. The Article 35 also says that the non-permanent residents of Jammu and Kashmir cannot get scholarships or employment opportunities under the Jammu and Kashmir government. And all these rights are only reserved to permanent residents of the Jammu and Kashmir. And above this, the article gives exclusive power to Jammu and Kashmir legislature to determine who are permanent residents of the state. So, because of these contentious provisions, the Article 35A had faced many criticisms. This is because of differential treatment of Indian citizens on the basis of residence. Okay. This is all about Article 35A and its provisions. Now we shall see the remarks made by Chief Justice of India on Article 35A. The Chief Justice noted that Article 35A violates three fundamental rights. Now let us see the rights one by one. The first one is Article 16.1. 
see this fundamental right ensured equality of opportunity for all citizens in public jobs but article 35a violated article 16 by reserving public jobs only for permanent residents of the jammu and kashmir so article 35a violated article 16 that is the right to opportunity for all citizens in public jobs then the next article is article 300 this article gave protection to property of individuals against state actions but this article also violated by article 35a because the property of non residents in jammu and kashmir was not protected by the state under article 35a okay this is another one violation and lastly article 191e see this article ensures the right to settle in any part of the country to indian citizens article 35a also violates this article as it imposed many restrictions on non residents of state and it only gave preference to permanent residents okay so these are the three fundamental rights that are violated by article 35a as per supreme court's observation and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about article 35a then about the criticism of article 35a now with these points in mind let us move on to the next part of the video that is to discuss preliminary practice questions today we have three practice questions i will solve two of them and one will be a quiz question for you and look at the first question here four species are given we have to find how many of them exhibit sexual dimorphism see sexual dimorphism means that males and females of a species look different from each other it is like having two versions of the same animal see we can witness a noticeable differences in male and female in the appearance itself for example in some animals males might have bright colors or larger features than females now coming to the species peafowl lion angler fish or weaving spider now look at these images here from these images we can see that male and female are different from each other so we can say that all the given species exhibit sexual dimorphism so the correct answer for the question is option c all four moving on let's take up the second question this question is regarding world athletics championship now look at the first statement it is conducted once in every four years see this statement is incorrect because the world athletics championship is conducted once in every two years that is it is a biennial event so first statement is incorrect now coming to the second statement neeraj chopra is the first ever indian athlete to won a medal at world athletics championship see this statement is incorrect because neeraj chopra is only the second indian athlete to won a medal at world athletics championship the first medal was won by anju bobby george in 2003 and the second and third consecutive medals was won by neeraj chopra that is in 2022 and 2023 in 2022 he won a silver medal in javelin throw and in 2023 that is in the recent world athletics championship he won a gold medal and this is the first gold medal for india okay so second statement is incorrect because neeraj chopra is the second indian athlete to won a medal at world athletics championship Now coming to the third statement it is organized by global association of international sports federations see this statement is incorrect because the world athletics championship is being organized by world athletics which is an international sports organization so all the three statements are incorrect so the correct answer for the question is option d none this is a quiz question for you today i will post this quiz question in a community section try to answer it and the answer for the quiz question will be provided in the comment section of the quiz question itself you can verify the answers and displayed here are the main questions for your practice go through the questions write your answers and post it in the comment section with this we have come to the end of the video if you found our video to be useful do like comment and share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe shankar is academy youtube channel thank you for listening